the idea of evacuating Southern California is a bit um, of a myth. Um, but nonetheless, you could, NRC's own estimate was you could have as many as a million casualties from a release at San Onofre. There's that much radioactivity inside those cores. And the only way it's, that radioactivity stays inside those cores is if the fuel is constantly cooled. Nuclear reactors are an amazing device because you can't really turn it entirely off. You can scram the reactor, you know, dump the control rods in, and that stops the fissioning. But there's still about 7% of the heat being produced by that fuel even when you have scrammed it. And that 7% is so large that that can cause the fuel to melt if it loses <coughs> cooling, even for weeks or months after they've scrammed it. In the spent fuel pools, these pools, the, like swimming pools where they put all the irradiated fuel, if they lost the coolant in a spent fuel pool, the National Academy of Sciences has said it is possible for not only melting to occur, but a nuclear fire. The cladding on the fuel is zirconium. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences said that if there were a fire, uh, a loss of cooling for the spent fuel pools, you could have the zirconium cladding catch fire in a spent fuel pool. And that could release not just the gaseous products, but the particulates, and that would be among the worst accidents conceivable. Because as I say, there are 10 Chernobyl's worth of radioactivity inside the spent fuel pools. So to keep us safe in Southern California, that fuel in the reactors and in the spent fuel pools has to be cooled all the time. Additionally, the second protection for us is that the containment structure, that concrete dome, has to work. You can't breach it can't bypass it because then the radioactivity goes directly to the environment. And that leads us to the current crisis. Um, there are very critical safety features called steam generators. These are devices that take the hot water from the primary coolant, which is radioactive, transfer the heat to cleaner water, the secondary coolant, and convert that into steam, which runs the turbines, which produces the electricity. Um, that it is called the primary coolant barrier because I've got radioactive water from the primary coolant inside these tubes and I have then uh, secondary water that goes to steam on the outside. And that secondary water goes outside the containment structure. These tubes have to be very thin because they have to transfer heat. But they have to be very strong because if they burst, you can lose coolant and you can release radioactivity into the environment. So the steam generators are absolutely critical. There are some backup features, but we have seen at Three Mile Island, at Chernobyl, and most recently in Fukushima, that oftentimes accidents involve not just the failure of your primary system, but also the backups fail as well. So the steam generators are critical. You, if you have a lot of those tubes burst, and you have some other problems that occur at the same time, you can have cooling lost, and you can have radioactivity go directly to the environment. So what is going on right now at San Onofre? In late January, in Unit 3, a tube burst in a one-year-old steam generator. You have to understand, when they built the reactors initially, they presumed the steam generators would last for 40 years. And so, in part, because of that, they didn't build a door into the containment structure large enough to replace the steam generator. They assumed the steam generator would last as long as the reactor. The first set of steam generators failed early. So about 25 years into their operation, they had to replace them. And a cost variously estimated at $671 million. I've seen figures about $800 million as well. I don't know what the correct number is, whether it's 670 is what Edison paid and when San Diego Gas and Electric had to pay its share, the total was about 800. But very large amount of money that you and I paid for because the first set failed. Um, to avoid a public hearing and to avoid a review by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Edison told the NRC that they were making a like-for-like -like replacement, which would, they claim, exempt them from a license amendment and the opportunity for you to request a hearing. At the same time, they published in a nuclear industry publication an article boasting about all of the substantive changes they had made. 
um, there is absolutely no question that those changes have resulted in the failure of the new steam generators. The old ones worked for 25 years. The new ones have failed in one or two years. They added additional tubes. They made design changes. There's a different alloy. There's a different thickness of the tube. And collectively, those changes um, and computer modeling errors made by Mitsubishi, who manufactured the steam generators, resulted in um, those steam generators having large numbers of failures one and two years into operation. In late January, one tube in Unit 3 burst. Edison said, don't worry, there's no release of radioactivity. The following morning, NRC said, well, there was a release of radioactivity. And also, by the way, NRC said, Unit 2 has been down for maintenance, and we've discovered hundreds of damaged tubes in Unit 2. A very unusual number for uh, steam generators that are so new. And so since January, both units have been down while they try to determine the extent of the damage. And the damage is really remarkable. Uh, I <coughs> worked for months to try to get Edison or the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to disclose how many tubes uh, show, are showing damage inside both units. And they did not want to release those numbers. They resisted and resisted and resisted. Finally, with the assistance of Senator Boxer, um, the numbers were released. And let me just give them to you for a moment. Because they're rather extraordinary. There are about 9,700 or so tubes per steam generator. And in Unit 2, 734 tubes are showing uh, wear or damage. And 861 in uh, the second steam generator in that unit. About 1,600 tubes are showing wear in Unit 2. And normally, you would see zero. You might see a few, a handful, one, two, or three. And in some of the worst steam generators in the country for a new steam generator, you might see 100 or 200. There is one new steam generator in the country that is showing thousands, and it's in trouble. Normally, there should be nothing. And they're showing 1,600 tubes that are damaged in a two-year-old steam generator. For Unit 3, the number is a bit worse. And that number is uh, 919 for one of the steam generators and 887 for another for a total of about 1,800. So uh, you immediately see why those numbers were not released. These are very sick puppies. Um, and additionally, they're both sick. Um, the fever is slightly higher in Unit 3 than in Unit 2, but both should be in intensive care. The reason I point this out is that Edison <coughs> continues to say that Unit 3 is more seriously damaged than Unit 2, and they believe that they can get Unit 2 up and running now. Um, that they intend to put in a request to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to restart Unit 2, potentially by running at lower power for a while, a little bit like you having a car with defective brakes, and rather than going and getting the brakes fixed, saying, I'll just drive at 50 miles an hour. Um, Edison has recently admitted that they will need to either repair or replace the steam generators in both Unit 2 and Unit 3. But they apparently want to restart Unit 2 without those repairs or that replacement and see what happens. <laughs> it is a kind of experiment in which there are 800, excuse me, eight and a half million guinea pigs. Um, it is conceivable that reducing the power will reduce the vibration sufficiently to slow the rate of damage. It is conceivable that reducing the power will simply move the location of that damage within the steam generator. But in any case, Edison seems to now recognize that reducing power is not a long-term solution, and that repair or replacement will be necessary. And yet, it is apparently intent on starting up uh, with a thousand or more damaged tubes 
and seen what happens. Um, well, understand that they have only plugged about 500 of the 1,600 damaged tubes um, in Unit 2 and only plugged about 800 of the 1,800 damaged tubes in Unit 3, meaning that the majority of the damaged tubes are still damaged and still not plugged. Let me explain plugging for a moment. They, um, they build these steam generators with a small excess number of tubes on the assumption that over 40 years some will go bad, just a few. And those bad ones you seal off so that primary coolant doesn't run through them. Um, there is a plugging limit. You cannot plug more than 8% of the tubes um, over the 40 year life of the steam generators and still run it full power. They've already plugged now about 4% of the tubes in just a year or two. In other words, they've gotten halfway to their plugging limit, which is supposed to take 40 years in a year. But there are more tubes that they haven't plugged that are damaged. And if those continue to wear, um, you will be very rapidly at that plugging limit. Again, the damaged tubes that they didn't plug, many of them are at 15 or 20 percent reduced thickness, and they have to plug at 35 percent. So they're halfway even to the plugging thickness. It's a little more technical than we need to be, but the bottom line is they've got an awful lot of damaged tubes, awfully early, caused by, in part, a computer modeling error. It's pretty remarkable which the NRC says that Mitsubishi underestimated the steam flow in critical regions of these steam generators by 400%. It's four times more steam flow than the modeling had predicted. And that excess steam flow and the condition of the steam is causing tremendous vibration, causing things to rub, causing damage to the walls of these very thin steam generator tubes. They haven't fixed that. They plug some of the most damaged tubes. They plug some tubes near the damaged tubes. And they want to start up and see what happens. And um, it seems to me a very poor approach to nuclear safety. Why is Edison so intent on doing that? Well, there's a large cost each month to pay for replacement power. But there is another reason, which is that under the state's Public Utility Commission's laws, after nine months of not being operable, operable um, the PUC is required to commence a review as to whether you and I should be paying each month, I think it's $54 million a month we're paying, for facilities that aren't producing any power. And thus, Edison may be forced to pay us back the money we paid them for electricity we didn't get. That review must start nine months after the reactors uh, were shut down. And in the case of Unit 2, that's sometime in November. So my concern is that Edison um, is feeling pressure to start up Unit 2 to try to beat that nine month deadline, or if they miss it, by missing it only a short amount so that the PUC still decides to stop such an investigation. Now you've all heard the statements made by Edison, which always begin with safety is our highest concern, and which always end with safety is our highest concern. And they have obviously gotten a very high priced public relations set of advisors to teach them to say those things. But the actual experience of Edison and of San Onofre seems to me to question that that is not only their highest priority, but even up there in the top two or three. And let me give you a couple of examples which really have shaken me. Um, several years ago, it was discovered that for five years, hourly fire watches at San Onofre had not been conducted, and that instead the fire watch log had been fabricated. Instead of going out each hour to check there wasn't a fire, the person stayed where she was and simply noted that she had done the inspection she hadn't done. Five years. I mean, I can understand it for a week before you catch it. 
I can't understand how Edison could not have caught it for five years. Uh, what did the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the uh, regulator, do? What kind of hammer came down on Edison for five years of fabricated records for five years and not doing these critical watches? They entered into what they called an alternative dispute resolution process. Now, you know, there's no dispute. They have fabricated the logs. It's violated the regs. And rather than impose fines or issue a notice of violation, NRC let Edison offer to engage in a couple of sensitivity training sessions for its workers on the importance <laughs> of complying with regulations. Now, why did the fire watches need to be done in the first place? In the 1970s, there was a reactor operated by the Tennessee Valley Authority called Brown's Ferry. Now, you've all heard that nuclear reactors are supposed to have backup systems on backup systems. If we have one set of cables, from the control room to the reactor. We have a second independent set. But the geniuses sent the cables, the primary and the backup set, through the same cable splitting room. So a, an electrician had gone down to do some work on the wiring, and lit a candle to make sure that they had sealed off a penetration, that there wasn't wind blow, or air blowing through, ignited the insulating material, caught the wiring on fire because the insulation was combustible and caught both the primary cables and the backup cables because they were both going through the same room. And this went on for a day or two. They lost control of the reactor. It took extraordinary efforts by courageous um, employees to finally bring the reactors under control and prevent a meltdown. This was what the industry refers to as a precursor event, a warning got to fix this or it could happen and cause a meltdown. So the NRC around 1980 issued new regulations requiring that you replace <laughs> wiring that is combustible with wiring that wasn't and that you separate your primary and your backup sets by sufficient distance or by barriers that could not burn or had a long time lag before they burned so that you wouldn't lose both your primary and backup systems. Well, Edison, like many other parts of the industry, dragged its feet, kept asking for extension after extension after extension, and said to, with each extension request, we will put in place temporarily compensatory measures, a nice phrase. The compensatory measure to not fix the fundamental fire violation problem was to do hourly fire watches, which in the end, they didn't do for five years. Um, so that has shaken me about Edison and Senator Offer. Let me give you a second example. You all saw from Fukushima the importance of what we call backup diesel generators. At Fukushima, an earthquake brought down the off-site power. It's an irony of nuclear power plants. You see the power lines coming out of San Onofre. Those are also power lines going into San Onofre because if they scram the reactor, they have to have power to keep running the pumps to keep cooling the fuel so it doesn't melt. And if you lose off-site power from an earthquake, a fire, sabotage, or a number of other reasons, you have to have backup diesel generators that will kick in in order to be able to run the pumps and prevent the reactor from melting. This has always been a problem for the industry because uh, uh, diesels are fairly unreliable. They sometimes won't start up. If they do start up, they overheat. You run out of fuel. But they're only required to have diesels that will operate for a relatively short time on the assumption we'll get off-site power reinstated. And of course, at Fukushima, that took a lot longer. But at uh, San Onofre, for a period of four years, the batteries were not appropriately connected to the backup diesel generators. Four years. Another time, they attempted to start up one of the backup diesels, and it wouldn't start. And this led them to have to scram the reactor because the second backup diesel was down for repairs. It was broken. Um, NRC, about two years ago, issued a chilling effects letter to Edison, asserting that Edison had created a atmosphere in which workers were frightened to bring forth safety complaints, that this itself caused a major safety problem. 
For the last three years, Santa Onofre has ranked number one in the nation each year for the number of safety complaints brought forward by workers to the NRC. Um, that's not a record to be particularly proud of. So we have a safety culture problem at Edison that is exacerbated by the steam generator difficulty, exacerbated by the huge population around the site, and exacerbated by the seismic risk. The Coastal Commission says that there are, is a uh, uh, earthquake complex near San Onofre capable of producing more frequent and larger earthquakes than the reactor was designed to withstand. And of course, in Fukushima, the earthquake was very much larger than what's called the design basis earthquake, the earthquake that under uh, kind of a cozy relationship between regulator and industry, they pretended was the largest that was credible. So uh, the late environmentalist David Brower wants to find a nuclear reactor as a complex technological device for locating earthquake faults in California. <laughs> <laughs> you build a reactor, you'll find a large fault. And I think the record is pretty good. Humboldt, um, Diablo, and so on. But of course, San Onofre. So that's a pretty toxic mix. A sick safety culture. A the sleep of the switch regulator. Large earthquake faults. Um, and a high population. And now, new steam generators that are crumbling that Edison wants to run the reactors with without repairing or replacing them. Let me end, and then we'll take some discussion and questions, with the current situation, the current crisis. On Monday, Edison announced that it is letting go one-third of its workforce in Santa Maria. 730 people. Now, I just run through for you the history of this site with the safety problems. It is hard to conceive with that many safety problems that you will run a place better when one out of three workers is no longer there. It is likely also that as they let people go, they will do so selectively so that the people who have raised safety questions are the first to be asked to leave. Edison said that they had this reduction in force in planning stage for the last two years. And it is possible that that is part of the explanation. But at the same time, uh, they admit that a significant portion of what they have, of uh, the workforce reduction, is due to the situation regarding the steam generators. And because Edison has not been very candid, we can only read between the lines. But they said something remarkable in the press release. They said they were letting go a third of the workforce in part because the long-term viability of the plant was now in question. They added that Unit 3 is unlikely to restart anytime soon. But it's that first sentence that's intriguing. There seems to be a recognition that this, as I say, is one sick puppy, and that those steam generators leave them in a condition that it may simply not be viable to continue to operate um, San Onofre. Um, Ted, uh, is it Carver or Craver? Does someone remind me, the head of Edison? Craver. In an investment call, investors call, the SEC requires several weeks ago, made an enigmatic state statement. He said that it's quite straightforward to figure out whether or not this is a viable entity. And if not, there are other options on the table. Well, what are the criteria for determining if this is a viable entity? And what are those other options? If you read the tea leaves, getting rid of a third of the workers, and admitting that part of that is because the facility may not be viable and that Unit 3 may not start up again, it's pretty clear that they really don't believe at least one of those units will be up in any foreseeable future because you can't get rid of workers and get them back quickly. It's not you know, like putting someone on a shelf and say, I'll call you next week when we need you. They will go off and get other jobs. It will also create tremendous morale difficulties um, within the ones who remain. So obviously they think Unit 3 
um, uh, is unlikely to restart. But there's an implication that they think Unit 2 isn't viable in the long term. They apparently have made statements that e both Unit 2 and Unit 3 require major repair or replacement of the steam generators. Replacement, by the way, would cost another billion dollars after we just spent close to a billion to replace them and to have to do the uh, inspections and so on on this last set. Um, at some point, that many billion dollars ends up becoming a really foolish use of money for an ancient, decaying, archaic, aged reactor. You're throwing good money after bad. There is an order from the Coastal Commission, I'm excuse me, the Water Board, that San Onofre must end once through cooling. Right now it takes water from the ocean, sucks in a lot of sea life, dumps the hot water back in the ocean, boiling, or at least heating up the water enough that damaging a fair amount of life. They were supposed to end that. Their own estimate is that might be about $2 billion to put in replacement steam generators. Uh, uh, replacement for the Western cooling to put in those cooling towers. So a billion for new steam generators, two billion for cooling towers, whatever post Fukushima upgrades may be required, whatever additional expense to deal with an aging reactor, very quickly does one understand just from the economics, it does not make sense to continue to operate. Some years ago, Unit 1 had steam generator problems. And the PUC's Office of Repair Advocates did an analysis saying it made no economic sense to keep running. And Unit 1 was shut down. It seems to me likely that the management of Edison knows that it is not economically viable to keep running Units 2 and 3. But what worries me is that rather than face that fact now, they're going to try to start up Unit 2 in its crippled condition at somewhat reduced power, say 70%. Run for six months, shut it down, see what's going on inside, run for a little while longer, uh, just to avoid facing the inevitable. If those steam generators for safe operation require significant repair or replacement, and you don't want to do that, bite the bullet now, uh, indicate that they're going to stay down, and we need to then put in place the replacement renewable power. And I am concerned that our state officials, led by Governor Brown, are failing to confront that necessity. We get about 2,200 megawatts of electricity from the senator for units when they're running. So there is a deficit of about 2,200 megawatts. We've gotten through the summer fine. We'll probably get through the rest of the summer fine. We can probably limp along for another year or so. But if you're going to put in replacement power, you have to start now. And there is no better place than Southern California, where the Saudi Arabia of sun. <laughs> if a windmill or a photovoltaic array failed, you don't put at risk eight and a half million people. You don't have the potential for massive release of radioactivity or other toxic materials. So, we need to get those replacement sources of power underway. I am troubled that Edison and the Public Utilities Commission and the governor are not standing, coming up to the plate, being candid with us and getting that underway. So we may have the worst of all possible worlds if you don't all organize. And that is unsafe crumbling reactors could be restarted even though the operators know they can't run for very long. Something bad could happen while they're running. And it was inevitable that they had to get replaced in the first place. So we need some sensible policies. We need to protect the public here. And in closing, let me just ask you to visualize what might happen if the restart occurs. And that is to urge you to visualize a Fukushima in uh, Southern California. Uh, it can be very much worse than Fukushima as well, depending on which way the wind blows. Very much worse. The only way to prevent that is to keep these units down and to start putting in place the safe, renewable alternatives immediately. But that's not going to happen based on what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission does, the 
NRC is an almost exclusively captured regulatory agency captured by the industry it's supposed to regulate. In all its years of existence, to the best of my knowledge, the NRC has never turned down an application for a reactor license in the contested proceeding. It's like a judge that always hangs. Um, the industry owns at least four of the five commissioners. In most years, it's owned all five. Um, you haven't a chance under those circumstances unless you change the underlying situation. Um, the Public Utilities Commission can fix this tomorrow. It can tell Edison, we're not going to let you get any rates uh, from the ratepayers for it, put that money into building renewables. But who is the chair of the Public Utilities Commission? Um, a man named Michael Peavy, who before he went to the PUC was the number two at Edison, <coughs> who is the chief of staff for Governor Brown, um, a woman who was a vice president at PG&E, the other major nuclear utility in the state. Uh, you and I have very little uh, power compared to the power of these uh, large political players. They have big name lobbyists with big budgets to support campaigns. But all important fights are unequal. And we have won over the years many, many unequal fights. So um, I believe that we can get some sense into these policy decisions, but not if we remain quiescent. So let me end with a very brief story I mentioned to my host this morning. Um, there was once a convention. Um, of anthropologists, the American Anthropology Association, and one of the anthropologists ran into the hall saying, I've discovered it, I've discovered it. And he asked, what have you discovered? He says, I found the missing link. And if you remember, decades ago, they used to talk about the missing link between anthropoid ape and human beings. And so he said, I found the missing link. And they said, oh, really? And uh, what is it? Oh, okay. And he says, it's us. <laughs> We are the missing link between apes and human beings. And all of us have the obligation to speed up that evolution so that our society becomes